All right, thank you so much for, for the invitation to speak here. I want to tell you about some exciting developments in the field of inverse problems that have come because of advances in machine learning and in particular in deep learning. And so what's particularly exciting about these developments is they also afford an opportunity for very interesting theory that is useful both from a deep learning and machine learning perspective and also in, from an applied mathematics perspective. So the frame of this talk is very much going to be from the background of like compressed sensing and the rigorous theory that that has produced and bringing that into the deep learning world. So this talk is about how to use learned generative priors for solving inverse problems. Uh, so let's talk about first like what, what are some sample inverse problems which we might be able to you know, have a starting point for saying something interesting using uh, deep networks. And here's a couple of problems that, that we'll, we'll think about. So all of these problems have the form of there are some measurements of some object, which in this talk will generally be an image. And so, for example, we could have noisy measurements, we want to denoise it. We could have missing pixels, we want to solve in painting. Uh, we could have a low res sample and want to super resolve it. Or a bit more abstractly, we could have uh, some sort of like linear or nonlinear measurements of this image from which we're then attempting to reconstruct the, measure, uh, the image. And from this, uh, from this framework is uh, the famous compressive sensing problem, but also the phase retrieval problem where you're trying to recover a signal from phaseless linear measurements. So we'll talk a lot about the compressed sensing and phase retrieval problems here, but a lot of the ideas also apply to these other inverse problems. Okay. So now, in order to, to give a little bit of context, let's set the stage a bit. Right? The, the dominant model for what images look like comes from this like, standard prior of a, called a sparsity prior. And so here, for example, is an is a image of a photographer uh, at, at set at MIT in a, an era that is not quite clear, given the audience, <laughs> the buildings in the background, but the the camera uh, as it looks. Uh, but the, this is an image on the left, and then the image on the right is the sparse approximation with respect to a wavelet basis. All right, so here there is a basis, and you, I can represent an image very well using very few coefficients with respect to that basis. And so now this idea has led to very substantial improvements in the state of the art of image processing problems. Um, and one, at a mathematical level, the reason for this is because of the following, uh, sort of like, uh, the, the following uh, convex relaxation. So ultimately, if our model for natural images is that they are sparse with respect to some known basis, then that might suggest a way of solving inverse problems. And that, the way that suggests is, give me an image that is consistent with my measurements that is as sparse as possible in an appropriate sense. So if, say, what's on the left half of the screen, say x are the coefficients of this image in some basis, so then we might want to minimize the L0 norm, i.e. the number of non-zero entries of x, subject to the measurements, so phi of x, being equal to what was handed to us. Right? So now famously, this problem is NP hard to compute, and so there's this convex relaxation where we replace the L0 norm with the L1 norm, and this has led to a huge boon of results both practically and theoretically. Right, so just to sample, like, what, what is that centerpiece result? Because this is what we're going to try to model off of in the later part of this talk. This central result is this uh, basis pursuit problem where, let's say, uh, so if we want to minimize the L1 norm of some vector subject to linear measurements of that vector, then the question is, like, well, how many measurements do we need and does that work? And here we can, um, we now have this standard theory, which is, say, if you have enough random measurements of that sparse vector, then if you solve this problem, then you will get your true sparse signal. So again, let's just step back for a second and say, what is going on here, right? There is some signal, there is an undersampled uh, measurements of that, which is to say there's an infinite sea of solutions, and we're trying to pluck the one out of it that is consistent with the data that uh, is as sparse as possible. And so then uh, Emmanuel Candez and Justin Romberg and Terry Tao and David Donahoe have had uh, seminal results in this area. 
All right. So now, now we move on to sort of the, the, the very modern times. Right? There's incredible advances from the deep learning community and from the computer science community in sampling natural images. For example, all of these images that you see on the screen are synthetic, right? They're computer-generated samples, for example, of human faces, of bedrooms, of MRI scans, cells, fingerprints. You can almost choose like any domain, and probably someone has trained a generative model for that domain, from which you can now get a <clears throat> sort of a, a, a synthetic way to generate images. And this now offers incredible opportunities for inverse problems. Because that means that you're now able to ask the question, what image in the range of my generator is most consistent with my data? Right? Whereas before, the dominant frame was, what image that is sparse in this particular basis is most consistent with my data? Right? And so this is quite a bit of a philosophical uh, shift away from some exogenously imposed basis towards something that is genuinely learned from data. Right? So the impressive performance of these generative models shows that we should probably expect corresponding performance in inverse problems if we use the structure that these models are clearly learning. Okay? Uh, so I want to provide the outline of this talk. Right? So the, the main things that I want you to, to get from this talk are the realization that like generative models provide state-of-the-art performance for inverse problems. Right? This is an empirical claim. So then the question is, why can they do this? And the reason is because they can provide lower dimensional priors than sparsity can in some cases, and they can be directly and efficiently exploited. And we will talk in detail about uh, item two. So then now what's very exciting is that this framework then inspires a new paradigm for doing basic science research. Uh, which we'll talk about uh, at the end. All right, so so let's let's look at this this first bit about um, the performance of generative models. So now let's ask if I have a generative model, then how do I use it to solve an inverse problem? And this ends up being there ends up being a relatively simple formulation for this. But let's just say somehow we've trained a generative model. And so what I mean by that is somehow I have acquired, usually via learning, a map, which we'll call G, which goes from some low dimensional space, let's call that RK, into image space. And then different latent variables that are all K dimensional would be put in, and then they might hand out different images as the output. And so what we see is a grid of like potential sample synthetically generated images. Right? So the goal now is to say, what point in the range of G is consistent with my measurements? And so we can write down this uh, um, empirical risk minimization, which is to say, if what I'm observing is phi of an image, then what I want is to find a point in the range of G such that phi of G is equal to the measurements that I have, phi of X naught. And so then in the absence of any particular other method for doing this, we might start by writing down this non-convex optimization program, where we want to minimize over this latent code Z, of phi of g of z minus phi of x naught in L2. And so this will be the empirical risk uh, formulation. Right? So now the, this formulation has led to improvements in a variety of fields, for example, in denoising, in painting, super resolution. And most notably, there have been huge gains in compressed sensing. For example, a, a, a recent paper by uh, Ashish Bora and others at University of Texas at Austin shows that if you're doing compressed sensing with a generative model, you can outperform sparsity models by 5 to 10x in number of measurements at comparable reconstruction errors. And so this is very significant development because it says the standard paradigm of enforcing uh, sparsity when you're enforcing some structural prior may be beat if you can learn about the data which you're sampling from. And so then further, there's been like uh, two orders of magnitude of speed up in MRI imaging from uh, Morteza Mardani and colleagues at Stanford University uh, in this MRI setting. And so there's huge empirical performances that are now begging for some theoretical understanding to, to why they work. And so that theoretical understanding is what I want to work toward at uh, uh, today in getting an explanation for. Right? So the, 
as I said, oh yeah, so a question. Right, so the question is, how does like, dictionary learning compare to these methods? Right? Uh, so I, at a, at a like, problem formulation point of view, right, dictionary learning is saying there is some dictionary of items, and your image is going to be a linear combination of some of the items in that dictionary. Right? And so then there you have to both learn the representation and learn the coefficients of any particular image with respect to that representation. So from a, from a philosophical perspective, well, the main challenge of dictionary learning in this environment is that it's fundamentally a linear signal model, which is to say it's going to believe that like, the representation of your image is still the union of a bunch of subspaces. Right? But if you go and ask yourself, what really is the manifold of natural images, then you're not going to expect it to live in the union of subspaces. So already... Right, so, right, so, so I, I can't uh, cite a result that has a head-to-head -head comparison, as there's some, it's, there are definite challenges in making very fair comparisons between these methods. Uh, but I would get, I, I would emphasize that there, there's quite a bit of like a philosophical difference between the capabilities of a dictionary learning model and the capabilities of a generative model trained by deep learning. Like for example, you could train in, in deep learning, and this will have a slide in the, and later on in the talk, like very natural deformations of objects, like for example, changes in pose of a human, are very easy for a deep learning system to encode. But if you're going to search for a sparse coding perspective for that, then you're going to have wildly different dictionary items that are involved in very semantically close images. So it would, I would be very, very surprised if uh, sparse coding could outperform these methods, uh, but this is a comparison that you know, should be done. All right, All right. So, so we're back to the sort of like the, the, the main bulk of this talk, which is why, like, what is the strength of using generative models, particularly over sparsity-based models for image recovery? Right? And what I want to argue is that strength comes because the dimensionality of the representation you can learn using generative models is lower than what you would get from sparsity. Right? And then further, that dimensionality can actually be more efficiently exploited. Right? And we're going to look at this in two you know, challenging problems, the problems of compressive sensing and the problems of uh, phase retrieval. All right, so let's look at deep compressive sensing problem. All right, so this problem will be, uh, will be posed as follows. I am going to assume that I have a trained generative model that is good, which is to say someone has said, here's a class of images, say MRI images, and they have trained a generative model to output examples of that class that are exhaustive in a sense. And then I'm going to say there is some image, X0, which is the image that I have actually measured in my device, and then there are going to be linear measurements of that given by A times X naught. This is a highly underdetermined system. Uh, and then my goal is to recover this image given those measurements. Right? So I want to find some point in the range of this generative model that is consistent with the measurements that I have. Right? So again, this is not focusing on the question of learning the generative model. Right? This is focusing on the question, what do you do with the generative model once you have it? And so this is very much a difference in perspective from like a straight up machine learning, deep learning perspective. How do I get better natural you know, images or synthetically generated natural looking images to how do I use those naturally looking synthetic images once I have them? Okay. All right. And uh, so this, this paper by Bohr is one of the first works uh, on this and posed this uh, non-convex optimization problem for solving it. Uh, and so, as, as I mentioned before, if you solve this problem, then you can get 5 to 10x improvements in the number of measurements over L1-based ideas. 
Uh, they also had some theory, and since this is a theory uh, workshop, I want to emphasize the theory side of things. And here, like the first bit of theory that we had for this problem, or really that they had for this problem, uh, said that if you can solve the non-convex optimization problem, then you get what you're looking for, which is to say, if you have, an, if you are imaging a point near the range of this network, then uh, if you can solve that non-convex program, then you get something very close to the true image that you are after. And my point on the slide is not so much the exact details of this theorem, but it's more the, the flavor of the theorem, right? It says, if you've minimized this non-convex program, then you have recovered your image. So unfortunately, these problems are non-convex. And so what that means is that it's not clear that you can optimize the problem. Right? And generally, it's, it should be expected to be NP-hard, except in special cases. Uh, and so that is, you know, sets, sets the scene like this inspires work to show that there may be some recovery guarantee, right? That if you have the conditions, you might be able to prove you get the right image uh, back, right? Uh, and so... Uh, the point that I want to say is that if you have a random generative prior, then that is going to provide a theoretical context for proving rigorous recovery guarantees. So by rigorous recovery guarantees, I mean a theorem that says, if you run this algorithm down this objective, then you will get the answer that you're looking for, right? Something that's of that specificity. All right. So let's let's set the let's set the stage here. Right. So let's say I'm I have my generative model, which is now script G, right, which goes from some low dimensional space R K to a high dimensional image space R N, and then I'm going to assume uh, a particular structure on that model. Right. And so here we're going to bake in like the core structure of artificial neural networks. And that is to say there's some linear operation followed by a nonlinear activation and another linear operation followed by a nonlinear activation and so on for D layers, right? So of course, with real neural networks that solve real problems, there's a lot of bells and whistles to them, uh, but this at a mathematical level is the starting point for really getting at a, a recovery theory that can actually assert guarantees of recovery. Uh, so more or less what this is saying is Suppose I have a fully connected neural network with no bias terms. Then we're going to assume that that network is expansive, which is to say each layer is bigger than the previous layer. Right? And this is natural because we're studying a iterative network, which is to say it's going from something low dimensional to high dimensional. Right? And so then we're also going to assume that this network is Gaussian, which is to say all of the weights are random. And this is a reasonable thing to do because in practice, even fully trained networks out in the wild, like AlexNet, have a random character to their coefficients. Like if you plot the weight vector or the weight coefficients and gram that looks very similar to a Gaussian. And there are other networks out there that also are, that are very interesting that also have random properties. And so studying random networks is highly relevant. Uh, and then, and here we have this biasless case. So here the problem is, let there be this G, which is fixed. I mean, it's randomly generated, it comes from this random process, uh, but it is fixed. And then now the question is, if what you're observing is G acting on some latent code Z naught, the quite, and if you measure A times G of Z naught, can you get back uh, Z naught? Right? There that's X naught, but what that meant to say is Z naught. Right? And if you have Z0, then you can run it through your generator to get G of Z0, which is now your sample image. Right? Uh, and so there's a, a, a theorem in this direction that I put out with Vlad Vorninsky uh, about two years ago, maybe a little less sent, uh, which says that if you're solving compressive sensing with a random generative prior, then that has a favorable geometry for optimization. So by favorable geometry for, uh, for optimization, what I mean is that at any point around the, the two saddle points, or around two critical points, there is a descent direction. And so you can think of like the energy landscape of this non-convex program as looking at what's on the right. This is the picture and expectation. But what it shows is that, yes, this problem is non-convex, but it's not that non-convex. If you run a gradient descent, you should expect to either get stuck in this little region on the left 
or stuck in the global optimizer on the right. And now the result of this theorem, so what it says is that if you have a random network and it's sufficiently expansive, then, uh, and you have a sufficient number of measurements, then with high probability at any point, no matter where you are, there is a descent direction given by a specific formula. So with a, where the directional derivative is strictly negative if you go down that direction. Uh, outside of a neighborhood around the true solution and a neighborhood around this um, critical point that's sort of a negative multiple of the true solution. Okay. So this is a, a very exciting result, particularly because it has optimal sample complexity in the dimensionality K. Right? So we can look at this and say, how many measurements do we need? Well, the number of degrees of freedom in the system is K, and so we should expect to get away with O of K measurements, and that's what we see. So the sufficient number of measurements is uh, that M, this item two, M needs to scale proportional to D, or excuse me, proportional to K, and then there's the additional factors in D, the depth of the network, and additional factors in, that are logarithmic in the size of the network. Right? So this is saying that these generative priors can be efficiently exploited. And so that is to say, if you have a dimensional generative prior, then you can get away with O of K measurements. And that's like the first place which you would start in establishing a, a rigorous uh, recovery guarantee theory. Okay. Um, so then just to give you a, a sense for the proof, I won't go too much in the, in the technical details, but it's one based on concentration. So here, right, so there was objective function, which I'll call objective of Z. And then there's uh, this objective is differentiable almost everywhere. So let's just consider for now the points where it's differentiable. Then there is some gradient of that objective, and that hands you descent direction. We'll call that V sub X. And now there is an expectation for V. It's a random quantity after all. And so it, there is some explicit formula for its expectation. And so what the proof really boils down to is how do you show that the gradient of this random function is very close to the expectation of the gradient of this random function uniformly in Z? If you can show that, then all you have to do is assert, well, where an expectation is the, is the function you know, have a large gradient or a non-zero gradient, and then that hands you the result. Right? So now this is the structure certainly vast majority of the difficulty of this work is item three, which is how do I get these estimates that are uniform in space for these very complicated objects uh, uh, from these neural networks? And just to show you at mathematical level, like what's going on here, is ultimately these theorems rely on a deterministic property. So in the paper, we call this, this called the, the weight distribution condition. And if the network satisfies this weight distribution condition, then you get the good property of the, uh, of the theorem. And so what this condition says is it's about a matrix um, concentration estimate. Right? So there is there's some matrix that's formed by the weights of the neural network. So at each layer, you have some weight matrix W, and say each row of that matrix corresponds to the weights of a particular neuron. And then what we need to assert is that this particular random quantity about these weights concentrates around its expectation. So here, if those weights are WI, then what we need is that sort of the sum of the indicator function of WI acting on some particular X being greater than zero times the indicator function of WI acting on some Y being greater than or equal zero and WI, WI transpose needs function U, which is the expectation of this quantity. Right? So here, if you think, what is the behavior of the system? It's a uh, discontinuous matrix-valued random function. And so ultimately, the difficulty of this work is very challenging to prove because it requires showing uniform concentration estimates of these discontinuous matrix-valued functions. And the reason that's hard is because the tools for showing concentration estimates uniformly in space uh, for, for functions like this would be, say, to, at any particular point, assert high probability concentration, and then now take a net over the sphere and assert it simultaneously for every point on that net, and then argue using continuity that the points not on your net have the same behavior that the ones on your net. 
But this doesn't have continuity, and so then that argument needs uh, some considerable work to make happen. All right, so I'd be happy to talk about technical details, but this is just to show you at the end of the day what comes out and the thing that makes us all work is these uh, discontinuous matrix value concentration problems. And then when I think about what does it take to make progress in like, a theoretical sense in these problems from machine learning and from deep learning, uh, that's going to be like a very strong control of these objects of this nature. All right, uh, so then now just to show you some, so that was the, the introductory work in this. Uh, and then there's, there's, there's follow-up works that have create, uh, taken this story forward. For example, uh, in this paper with Wen Huang, who is my postdoc, and Reinhard Heckel, who's an assistant professor at Rice, and of course also with Vlad, uh, we show that uh, we present a specific subgradient descent algorithm that if you solve that algorithm, you provably converge to the global minimizer of this problem. And that algorithm has just a, a minor twist in it to make sure you don't get stuck in this other neighborhood. But the point is, there is an algorithm and it has good time complexity for, uh, that has a provable convergence guarantee. Uh, you could also say, well, what about the network architecture? And so then there's been exciting work from Fan Cheng Ma, Ula, Ulas Ayaz, and Professor Karman at MIT, which took the framework that we established and showed that you can get similar guarantees in the case of convolutional generative networks. Right? So our work from before, right, it was about fully connected general networks in order to get these, you know, the technical advances we need. And now we've already seen that this is extended to the case of convolutional nets. So it's very exciting to see that there's a momentum picking up in this area, but also, you know, there incredible architectural improvements that there are in reality that none of these uh, um, papers quite get at yet. And so there's considerable room theory in this problem. Um, so, so now we can start getting, you know, addressing this question. So why, why can generative models outperform sparsity models? Uh, and so one answer to this is because general models can admit lower dimensional representations than sparsity models. So let's do a proof by one example point. Suppose I had a class of images given by, say, like this train going down this track, right? So that's a one parameter family of images, right? Maybe it's not so interesting of a set of images, uh, but nonetheless, that is some set. And let's say that that lives on the manifold of natural images. And so this is a one dimensional set. And so say it's carried out by this red line. If you were to ask, how many measurements do I need in order to recover an image uh, from this class? The answer is not many. The answer should be O of one, right? But if you ask, what is the representation of these images in a wavelet basis? Then that answer is going to be, well, you're not really going to be having that much savings over arbitrary, uh, arbitrary images. And so you're definitely gonna need more than O of one measurements. Right? And same if you're coming from a perspective of dictionary learning or coding, or then you would have trained these works. Uh, we have trained this over a variety of images. The, re the amount of uh, dictionary items that you would need to explore, explain any of the images in this class is quite high relative to the dimension of this class. Right? So this is one improvement which is to say, if you're really dealing with the natural signal model as a manifold, then you get dramatic improvements, provided that you can learn that manifold efficiently. Now, if you can't learn the manifold efficiently, then maybe those improvements, this is why we have the field of computer scientists, you know, making us sort of like the best models that we can get for these natural classes. Okay, so that's one story. The second story, is, well, maybe you can more effectively optimize over it, right? So here, uh, why can generative models outperform sparsity models? Well, another reason is because generative priors allow for direct optimization. So let's remind ourselves of the story with sparsity, right? Ultimately, that story was our prior, which was that your system is sparse, set up a problem that we could not solve. And so we relaxed it to an L1 minimization problem. And now this relaxation is famously effective in the case of compressed sensing, but it is also famously ineffective 
in the case of phase retrieval, which we'll talk about in the very next slide. But what I want to observe here is that this relaxation means that you're in a high dimensional space, right? Like you're in the space of all coefficients of your image. You're not in the actual true low dimensional representation. That's something that you can only get at if you've learned the real natural signal model. Right? And so this is what these generative priors do. Since they've learned a low dimensional representation, they allow you to operate in a low dimensional regime. And now in exchange for getting non-convexity, you get low dimensionality. But the advances in applied mathematics over the last decade or so have now started They've now started building tools that succeed in the non-convex setting. And so then the potential is to use those tools in these problems. All right. Uh, so, so now to go back to the point that I mentioned, which is that these sparsity priors are notoriously difficult in some problems. And let's say one problem that they're notoriously difficult in is phase retrieval. And so this problem is as follows. Uh, you have some signal x naught, and you have linear measurements on that signal, a of x naught, except I'm not going to allow you to see a of x naught. I'm only going to allow you to see the absolute value of a of x naught. This comes from like the problem of X-ray crystallography in other areas, where because of the physics of the detection of electromagnetic waves, it's difficult to measure the phase of the electromagnetic radiation as it's coming in, and instead what it measures is directly the power of that wave. Right? So that's how you have the amplitude, but not the phase. Right? This is a famous problem uh, for fundamental science reasons. And from a mathematical perspective, there is an open problem here that has you know, famously not been solved over the last 10 plus years. And that is, how do you recover a sparse vector from phaseless linear measurements? Right? This is challenging because when our model, or rather this is important, because when our model of natural images is that they're sparse with respect to a basis, it leads us to ask to solve this problem. Right? How do I do sparse phase retrieval? But what our work is saying is instead, don't solve sparse phase retrieval. Solve phase retrieval with a structured prior that is learned from data. And if you can learn it from data, then you can get a hold of this natural manifold, then you can exploit it efficiently. Okay? So what we look at is this deep phase retrieval problem where, say, you have phaseless linear measurements of some image x naught, which is given by the range of, in, is the range of a generative model. So again, we're assuming that someone has trained a generative model. And in this case, what that might mean is that one could go and build a model of the electron density maps of uh, natural proteins as they occur, right? Because proteins don't just happen. They're not random objects. They obey the laws of physics and chemistry. And so they have a lot of structure, which could be learned, right? But oftentimes the details of that structure are not necessarily used by practicing scientists when they're solving that problem. Right? And so here we, uh, we formulate this recovery problem uh, in a similar way to what was done before uh, in compressed sensing, and we get this non-convex optimization program. And so now uh, the, we have exactly the same story for this sparse phase or for this uh, uh, phase retrieval problem, this compressive phase retrieval problem under generative priors. And that story is, suppose your prior is k-dimensional. And it maps from RK into your image space. Then now assume you have measurements that are proportional to K up to other factors like D and log of the number of neurons in the network. Assume the network layers are sufficiently expansive. Assume the network is random and the measurements are random. So these are, so uh, the, the fact that measurements are random is a standard assumption in this field in order to assert theory. Uh, and then the theorem, which was proven uh, by my graduate student, Oscar Leong, and recently presented as an oral at NeurIPS in uh, Montreal, shows that uh, if you have that number of measurements that is proportional to K, then at any point, there's a strict descent direction down that objective, uh, except at the true global optimizer and a negative multiple thereof. Right? So what this is really saying is that then if you had a optimization algorithm, it would then converge to this global optimizer just like it did in the compressed sensing case, uh, but that is uh, in work that's going to come out. Right? So again, ultimately here, right, the story is 
can you efficiently exploit this natural prior given by a generative model? And in the case of compressed sensing, and also in the case of phase retrieval, the answer to that is yes. Uh, so, but this wasn't just theoretical work. This had an empirical component as well. What we did is we compared the recovery for, say, handwritten digits from very few phaseless linear measurements, and we compared that to other algorithms from the sparse phase retrieval world, such in these algorithms like called Sparta or Copram or truncated Wordinger flow. And this method was... Uh, performed much, much better than those existing methods for sparse phase retrieval uh, because of the reasons that I've mentioned multiple times, which is the dimensionality is low and it can be efficiently exploited. Okay. All right, so now to tie this together to be like, where, you know, where is this going? Right? One of the exciting things about this research is it, it says something perhaps about basic science and like ways that experimental scientists can proceed that may be different than how they're proceeding now, right? So this suggests like, a, oh wait, well we have a question, yes. So the question was, how was the generative model trained in, in this setting? So here, the generative model is trained entirely separate from the inverse problem that's solved. So in this case, there was a bunch of handwritten digits, so just from the MNIST uh, digit data set. And one of, one of the exciting things about this approach is that you can specialize, that you can have one group build the generative model for a particular image class, and then another group who's doing phase retrieval can use it, another group that's doing compressed sensing can use it, or denoising can use it, and they, so you allow this modularity of that representation. So this is in contrast to other deep learning methods for inverse problems where you may, for example, train an end-to-end -end system, but then in that case, you would have to retrain it for every single type of measurement modality that you have. All right, uh, so then in the, in the couple of minutes that I have left, I want to explore what this, this new framework for doing imaging inspired by deep learning. And that framework is to say, you are, say, an experimental scientist, and you are trying to image some particular natural signal class. So then first, what you could try to do, and in some cases this is possible, in other cases it's not, is collect a large data set of images in that natural signal class. So if you're doing MRI, collect a lot of MRI images. If you're doing phase retrieval, maybe collect a lot of electron density map images, and, and so on. So once you have that, then you train this generative model, and then at that point, you can now go collecting measurements for your own image, which you're trying to recover, uh, and then solve the optimization problem for that. Right? So this is perhaps a little bit different from the perspective that's there now, where that first step doesn't really exist. The second step is replaced with what handcrafted knowledge can you bake into a system of what you think the, the natural signals look like? Maybe, for example, there's a, a support constraint that these signals live here in, in, the, rain, in the images, uh, or maybe there's a positivity constraint, but these are relatively weak constraints that aren't learned from data. Okay? Uh, and so, I mean, very excitingly, there, there are, there's lots of progress in this area of collecting the data sets that are going to be fundamental to getting these methods to work. For example, there's like tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, electron density maps for proteins. And then recently, NYU and Facebook uh, released a large set of MRI images. And so you can imagine now, if you're some entity that's sitting on a, a large collection of data or say of images or of audio of a particularly important class, then releasing that data to the wild will significantly increase the speed at which we can get new and better methods for dealing with images of those classes. Okay? Um, so this is a theory conference, so I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention like what opportunities for theory do we have based on this work? Right, so there's, you know, of course, making the, making the theory apply to more realistic models of neural nets, um, making this theory apply to other inverse problems, for example, in seismology or, for exa or any other bit of scenarios. The proofs here are relatively quite complicated. I mean, they're very, very technical. And if what we learned you know, in compressed sensing is very simple proofs then inspire other researchers to use it to do great new things as well. And that's how we got the fields of matrix completion, the fields of phase retrieval with rigorous recovery guarantees. 
Um, it's possible, perhaps, to say interesting things about adversarial examples using these generative models. Uh, and then there are other contexts where we use sparsity and may benefit by explicitly learning the structure of the signals that we're trying to recover. Right? So again, right, so the main takeaways here, I mean, the, the things that I want you to think about most are, you know, so generative models can provide state-of-the-art performance in imaging contexts. Right? The reason for this is because they can exploit the fact that they have a lower dimensional representation of that signal class relative to other methods. Um, and then uh, that lower dimensional representation can be efficiently exploited. And then hopefully this will inspire new methods for experimental scientists. All right, thank you. For the generative models to work very nicely, usually they require a good number of examples, right, the training set. Is there any uh, theoretical limit set on a particular generative model that if the training set is, uh, the size of the training set is below that some kind of threshold, it won't work or it won't give you the necessary results? Is there any kind of theory in this line? So, yeah, so the, the question is, is, is there a, a theory for how many, how much data do you need in order to train these generative models? Exactly. Uh, as far as I know, the answer to that question is generally no. Um, and and that, I mean, I think the, the question of studying, like rigorously studying the learning process is of course like the holy grail of the theoretical view of deep learning right now. And so exactly. uh, progress on that would be well appreciated by you know, many, many, people. Uh, I will just like take this opportunity to indicate there are other approaches. For example, like one approach is this collect a bunch of data, learn model from that data. Another approach is to say, I don't have a lot of data, perhaps any data, maybe I can design methods that succeed without learning. And this will actually be part of the talk that I'm giving on Friday, which is a neural network prior for signals like this which require data. And there it's the architecture of the neural network itself which enforces the prior. So there, so there, you know, there, there, is a, there, there are a variety of things that you can possibly do in this scenario, but of course getting theory for when you have enough data to train your generative model would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. So the question is, do I have to actually train a generative model or do I, can I get away with just having the data from which one could train the generative model? Okay. So the answer, at least in the framework that we've studied is you, you have to have that model, right? Because you're optimizing directly an objective that calls G of Z. So you have to run a gradient descent or like a backprop over G. If you only have an indirect representation of G via this data, it's not clear how you would do it, and even if you did, it may be too expensive to compute those gradient directions. Uh, so very much this is, this is of the frame, and this is back to this, um, this, this middle step, right? Train the generative model happens before you use the generative model to do anything. And so train model is something then, you know, specialized experts could go and do, uh, who aren't necessarily the ones that are actually solving the inverse problem. So, so the question is, what condition uh, allows you to escape from local minima in the non-convex objective? Uh, and let's go back to this. Uh, right, so this, so the, this formulation, right, it's non-convex, so we should expect there to be uh, saddle points or local minima floating around. Uh, but the, the story that we have is that there are deterministic conditions under which you don't have local minima floating around, right? And, and so this deterministic condition, for example, is like this property on the weights of the network, which more or less what this says, I mean, this is, I know this is too technical to, to, to read and go over right now, but what this says is that if your weights are generally 
distributed over the surface of the sphere in roughly a uniform way, then when you have your weight matrices of your neural network and you're going to hit them with a RAILU, right, that's going to kill about half of the rows, then that half of the rows needs to act something like an isometry. And so what I mean, I, I don't mean an isometry, I mean some actual, there, there, it, it acts like some matrix which actually has a dependence on the angle between like the input to your network and some other input to that network. Right. So here, so the so the the really rough answer is the the network is expansive enough and random enough that there that each matrix more or less acts like an isometry except with angular dependence. Uh, and then similarly, there's another condition which I didn't mention, which is that the random measure the measurements that you have all have to also act like an isometry in the range space of the generator. And so those are the two deterministic conditions. And if you open up the paper, it'll say, if those two deterministic conditions are met, then you have the gradient directions everywhere outside of these two points. And so it... it right, so, so yes, the, the, if you have enough measurements in this random setting, then there are not spurious local minima floating around. If you don't have enough measurements, then there may be local minima floating around. Right? And so what this says is that the transition where you go from having local minima to not having local minima is the sample complexity which you, which you desire, which is to say O of K. Right. Yes. All right, so, so the question is, what is the condition on the measurement matrix A? Right? So, what, uh, so I, I don't have this on the slide, but the, the condition is that if I hand you a pair of points, if, if I hand you a pair of points in the range of your generator and another, point, uh, another pair of points in the range of the generator, then that matrix A has to act like an isometry on the, in the span of those two vectors. Right? Is that coming from Gaussian distribution? What's the sample complexity? How how large n should be? Uh, so the question is how well how large n should be? That is so that's the number of neurons in the network, uh, and so this is something which is say fixed in advance, such that the network is expansive, and so then the number of measurements that you need to succeed scales like the latent dimensionality k, but with a logarithmic factor in the number of neurons that you have. So you would think the network architecture is expansive and fixed. Once you have that, then how many measurements do you need? Because measurements are things you can go acquire, whereas if you've already trained your neural network, you're not going to go retrain it to have some other dimensionality. You're going to use it exactly as is. All right, yeah, Ravi. Do you see the, uh, the, the theorems that you're proving, the, uh, uh, the optimizations that you're able to perform, uh, informing the structure of the G, like for which G will you be able to do better, and therefore maybe those Gs are actually learn the data well as well? Is there any work in that direction? Yeah, so, so the question is, does, does this inspire new, our, our new understanding about what architectures might allow us to better exploit them? Uh, I, I don't have too much to say on this. If, if I had to say something, it would be that we want those networks to be as close to random as possible. And there are things that I can do to make a trained network closer or further from a random network. And generally, if I have, like, my, my main tool to make something very close to a random network is to have it be highly over-parameterized. Right? If I have a network that is, you know, less over-parameterized, then as it fits to data, I'm now going to diverge from randomness. So this may suggest, you know, a, another benefit of over-parameterization. But that's, you know, that's sort of just like off the top of my head for something it may inspire. Um, but in practice, you know, there's a difference between like the theory and the practice, right? The theory requires 
at each la layer of the network that it has to be expansive, it has to grow. But in practice, you don't actually have to have each layer grow, like some of the work that was done by um, like Bora at all, right? That has like networks that, that don't grow at some layers, right? So there's, there's, this is meant mostly to explain like why these approaches can work, hopefully to feed back to them, but that may be uh, coming in the future.